You know the old expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, here's a picture of sorts. It's a spec scan comparison by Almond Clinics. On the left is the brain of a 38-year-old who'd been drinking heavily, but only on the weekends, for 17 years. On the right is the scan of a healthy brain. Clearly, something is wrong with the person's brain on the left. There is, and it's not, alcoholism. Thanks to imaging technologies developed in just the past 15 years or so, neuroscientists and medical professionals are able to study the live human brain in action and over time. And what they are learning about the brain, much of it in just the 21st century, about how it develops, what harms it, and the brain disease of addiction, of alcoholism, is nothing short of profound. Yes, I said it. Alcoholism is a disease. It is not a moral weakness nor a shameful lack of willpower. It is a chronic, often relapsing, brain disease, one of the brain diseases of addiction. So what makes a person an alcoholic? How is it different than alcohol abuse? Or perhaps you just vehemently disagree with the statement that it is a disease. Stay tuned. Today's show is all about alcoholism. Brought you in part by Nimbus Design. Hello and welcome to Breaking the Cycles, a show where we share valuable information to change your life. My name is Lisa Fredrickson, and today I'm going to be talking about some of the brain research and science-based answers that explain the disease of alcoholism, and it's not alcohol abuse. You see, by its simplest definition, a disease is something that changes cells in a negative way. All diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, HIV AIDS, to name a few, affect some type of cell in our body. That's because every organ inside our bodies, the heart, the brain, liver, eye, kidney, lung, stomach, is made up of cells. Some diseases affect many organs. Some affect one or two. Alcoholism happens to affect many. But of particular concern is its effect on cells in the brain. You see, alcoholism is a chronic, often relapsing brain disease, one of the diseases of addiction. Why is it a brain disease? Because the chemical and structural changes in brain cells and neural networks that are brought about by the alcohol abuse, like what we saw in that opening scan, coupled with the brain cell changes that are brought about by the five key risk factors for developing the disease, together cause the disease of alcoholism to actually change brain functioning. As you've likely guessed, understanding this brain disease starts with understanding a few things about the brain and how the body processes alcohol. When a person drinks, the alcohol bypasses the normal digestive process and it enters the bloodstream through the walls of the small intestine, where it dissolves in water and travels through the bloodstream to areas of the body that are high in water concentration and are having lots of blood vessels, like the brain. It leaves the body through the liver. And as a very general rule of thumb, it takes the liver about one hour to metabolize to rid the body of the alcohol in one standard drink. What happens to the excess alcohol, the more than one drink per hour? It sits in the body waiting to be metabolized. Alcohol sitting in the brain is what suppresses normal brain functions because it changes the way neural networks in the brain work. And as a reminder, normal or moderate drinking is defined as no more than seven standard drinks in a week with no more than three of the seven in a day for women. And for men, no more than 14 standard drinks in a week with no more than four of the 14 in a day. A standard drink is defined as five ounces of table wine, one and a half ounces of 80 proof liquor, or 12 ounces of regular beer. But here's the problem. Drinking is not just normal or alcoholic. There's a whole gray area of drinking the level of drinking that causes the chemical and structural changes in the brain, like those we saw in that opening scan comparison. The drinking in this range is known as alcohol abuse, and it consists of drinking patterns like repeated binge drinking or routine heavy social drinking. Both alcohol abusers and alcoholics engage in drinking behaviors as a result of these brain changes because the brain controls everything we think, feel, say, and do. 
These drinking behaviors include getting into fights with family members or friends about the drinking, missing work or school, having unprotected or unwanted sex, not remembering what happened while drinking, getting into fist fights, lying and stealing, driving while impaired. Yet alcohol abusers are not necessarily alcoholics, and the majority of alcohol abusers will never become alcoholics. Thus, the earlier a person stops the alcohol abuse, the better for brain health and for stopping their drinking behaviors and for stopping the progression from alcohol abuse to alcoholism. For you see, a person is not born an alcoholic. Although genetics is one of the five key risk factors for developing the disease, it takes alcohol abuse to lay the groundwork for a person to become an alcoholic. Because it's the alcohol abuse that causes the kinds of chemical and structural changes we saw in that opening scan. And it's those kind of changes that makes a person's brain more vulnerable to the five key risk factors for developing the disease. The more risk factors, the more vulnerable. These risk factors include genetics. It's not that there's an alcoholic or a, an addiction gene, but rather a person's individual gene pool can predispose them to alcoholism. Just as a person inherits genetic traits from his or her parents or grandparents for predispositions to some cancers or eye color or height, so too we can inherit genetic differences that predispose us to alcoholism. Childhood trauma is a second risk factor. This can be verbal, physical, or emotional abuse during the early stages of a child's life, when their brain is wiring like crazy. Or it can be during the teen years when their brain continues to wire and go through an incredibly important developmental process. Trauma changes a child's neural networks, and these changes can make their brains more susceptible to using alcohol and to the influences of alcohol on their brains. A third risk factor is social environment. If a child or adult lives in a social environment where heavy alcohol use is considered normal and expected, always heavily consumed at holiday and family events, or in school or as part of the workplace culture, for example, that person may view heavy drinking as normal and so drink heavily themselves. Unfortunately, a heavy drinking pattern may not work in their brain. The fourth key risk factor is mental illness. The brain changes that occur with mental illness, whether that's post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, bipolar, to name a few, can be significant. Often a person with a mental illness will self-medicate the emotional pain of the mental illness by using alcohol. And the last key risk factor is early use. As you've learned in two of my prior shows, the brain goes through significant developmental changes from about 12 through one's early 20s. The wiring that goes on means that the teen brain is not the brain of an adult. So alcohol works differently in the teen brain than it does in the brain of an adult. Early use. Early use is the most significant risk factor influencing whether a person's drinking crosses the line from alcohol abuse to alcoholism. In fact, nearly one half of those who met the diagnostic criteria for alcoholism in their lifetime had the disease by 21, and two-thirds had it by 25. Now the reason for making such a point about the distinction between alcohol abuse and alcoholism is because treatment for the two is different and because alcohol abuse can lead to alcoholism. With alcohol abuse, it is possible for a person to change their drinking pattern and bring it back within normal or moderate limits. This change in drinking pattern is what can return their brain to health and thereby stop their drinking behaviors. With alcoholism, on the other hand, the, the brain embeds addiction-related neural networks around the characteristics of the disease, which include cravings, loss of control, physical dependence, and tolerance. The power of these embedded brain maps can only be altered by a rewiring of the brain by returning the brain to health, for which the first step is to stop all alcohol use entirely. That's because alcohol, even after months or years of not drinking, kickstarts the addiction-related embedded brain maps, causing the alcoholic to relapse into their disease. Bottom line, Alcohol abuse and alcoholism both cause drinking behaviors. All alcoholics go through a period of alcohol abuse, but not all alcohol abusers will become alcoholics. There are five key risk factors that contribute to a person developing the disease of alcoholism, 
genetics, childhood trauma, mental illness, social environment, and early use. And lastly, an alcoholic cannot drink any amount, ever, if he or she wants to stop the drinking behaviors and successfully treat their brain disease. The good news, the brain can heal. It can return to health, and an alcoholic can live a happy, healthy, productive life, only, however, if the alcohol use is stopped entirely. And there are many wonderful, effective treatment options, by the way. But alcoholism must be treated for what it is, a chronic, often relapsing, brain disease. To learn more about the disease of alcoholism, the disease of addiction in general, check out the Addiction Project's website. I encourage everyone to look through this website. There is so much important information here. To anonymously assess your or a loved one's drinking patterns, check out NIAA's website, Rethinking Drinking. And look for a repost of this show at breakingthecycles.com, where you can add your voice to the conversation. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.